I think people can be amazingly strong and the average person just doesn't get it. Welcome to Profoundly Pointless. My name is Nick. In this episode, we're going to look at the rising popularity of powerlifting. Our guest has four world championships and 78 world records. This is powerlifter Jennifer Thompson. Thank you for joining us. Like and subscribe if you get a chance, and check the description for a discount on HelloFresh. Were you born strong, or do you feel like you got strong? I was definitely not born strong. I definitely got strong. <laughs> what got you into it? I was a runner all through high school, and um, when I was in college, I was doing like road races. I liked to run with my dad. He was a runner. And um, one of my roommates um, in college, we just lived in a rental house and we all commuted to school. He was way interested in weightlifting and he actually had uh, a gym in the bottom of our rental house. And so like at four o'clock every day, all his friends would show up and they would go down and they would play music and they would lift and they would have a great time. So they kept inviting me down to come learn how to lift weights with them. But I would, it was still in a time where like women didn't really lift weights. They were worried about being bulky, you know, or looking like a man. And um, I, I guess I was maybe just a little intimidated by it. But um, one day I'm like, OK, I will go down there. I, you know, I kept asking. So I'm like, I'll go down there and I'll give it a go. And so they kind of showed me how to do everything. And I loved it. So I completely stopped running because. Honestly, I didn't really enjoy it that much, but I wanted to like not ga gain college weight and I wanted to stay in shape. And it was kind of something I had in common with my dad. Um, but I started just full on lifting weight and um, I, I learned to love it. When do you think that like, okay, when you went from like enjoying this to really going after it, to getting into competitions, to doing that kind of stuff? When Oh, it was years. Like I just sort of puddled around in it, you know, I'd work out and then I'd leave it for a while then I'd come back. Um, but I really was enjoying just like the um, changes in my body, you know, just looking stronger and gaining some muscle. And I was a pretty uh, underconfident person. I was, uh, had, I would say probably low self-esteem. I was real nervous and timid. And I found like the more I was training, the better I was sort of feeling and I was feeling a little more confident and a little stronger. Um, and so then I th I, several years into it, I started really getting into a program and sticking with it and lifting with the guys. And then I was catching up to them, like as far as their weights were going, like no longer was I like just doing dumbbells or putting baby weights, you know, on the bar. I was starting to actually put something significant on there. And so it was like, I'm getting, I'm getting kind of strong. And um, this was back, you know, in the nineties the and in the nineties, we didn't really have internet and things like that. You know, it was still very slow. There was no YouTube, there was no nothing. And so honestly, I knew I was getting strong, but I couldn't, I didn't know where I fit in. I didn't want to be a bodybuilder because that's really kind of what you did if you were strong. Um, I read a lot in the muscle and the fitness magazine, said all these workouts and stuff. And I really admired the way the women look, but I was not really interested in getting on a stage and, and posing in a bikini. I just was not comfortable with that. And then the other thing they had back then was um, fitness where the girls would do all the tumbling and, um, you know, it was a fitness competition, but I didn't have a gymnastics background or a cheerleading background. So like that wasn't even really something that, I could even entertain and we just had my the one of my roommates I ended up marrying <laughs> and uh and we ended up just falling onto a powerlifting competition on our honeymoon and Venice Beach California and Muscle Beach they had a bench press competition so I walked up to it and I was looking at it and I started talking to some people I'm like I could do this and so um they just kind of directed me in the right place back then there was a magazine called powerlifting USA and that's where they lifted, listed all the meets coming up. And like you literally would take the entry form out and fill it up, put your check in there and mail it to the meet director, you know, and that's how you entered. Um, and so I think I did my first one in 1997 or eight. I can't remember. Wow. Yeah. And then once I hit there, like I realized like I was like bench pressing the world or the uh, American record. Like I had broke all the records my first time out. Like I had no idea I was that strong. 
Man. Okay, but were you breaking the records because you were just that strong or like the record was the record because nobody was really kind of doing it? Um, I think it, I like to think it was because I was just that strong. <laughs> I'm going to go with that one. <laughs> yeah, that's the one I would go with too, right? No, like I'm just really that strong. I'm just that strong. <laughs> so when people think of like, right, like I kind of think of weightlifting and bodybuilding, What what is powerlifting like? How would you kind of just, how is powerlifting different than weightlifting or other kind types of exercise? Uh, well, it's, it's just different exercises. It's the squat, bench, and deadlift. Um, weightlifting is the snatch and the clean and jerk. And I kind of think about powerlifting as being more like, um, I guess, the normal person's events. You know, like if you go into a gym, any weekend warrior or just someone that loves to train as bench pressing or squatting, maybe not deadlifting, but it's, they're just kind of normal exercises you see do a lot. Uh, the squat or the weight training, the, um, the weight lifting, excuse me, the snatch and the clean and jerk, that requires like a lot of flexibility, a lot of technique. It's not something that you would just be able to walk up and do, right? And it's just two very specific exercises. So, I mean, that's really the difference between powerlifting and weightlifting is the exercises. And then basically at a meet, you you get three opportunities in each event. So for you always start with the squat and you get three attempts at the squat to get your be- your highest squat path. There's lots of rules. And then you do the bench, same thing with bench, and then the deadlift, and then you take your biggest uh, lift in each one and add them up for the total. And then whoever's the highest total wins. Is... I just feel like it's very basic, normal, and easy to understand. <laughs> yeah, it's probably like whoever's the strongest person wins, right? Yeah. I... It's, I would imagine it's divided into weight classes and all yep. that kind of stuff. And now, age groups, yep. Now, what weight class can I, is that, in, can I ask that question, right? No, you, you know, what, can ask okay. that question. Um, what, what, we don't worry about our, like, weight and our bodies and stuff in powerlifting. We always, we celebrate women's sizes. You know, we always want the thick thighs and the peach butt. <laughs> so what, now, throughout your career, like, what weights have you competed at? Is that a thing that uh-huh. changes over time? Well, it is funny because they have changed the weight classes like multiple times because I started in 99 and I still compete now. Um, so my and it's all in kilos because it's an international sport. So um, my very first weight class was 60 kilos, which was 132 pounds. So I competed in that in a while. And then they changed it to 63 kilos, which was 138.8 pounds. So I did that for a while. And then just two years ago, they switched them back. Um, so, um, at this point, like going down to 132 was way too low. I put on too much size. So now I'm up in the next weight class, which is 148.8. <laughs> so at that weight, what's your squat? What's your most ever, like your best squat, best mm-hmm. deadlift, uh, best, best bench? Best squat bench. is 360. Uh, my best bench is 327 and a half. And then my best deadlift is uh, 457. You can bench press 327 pounds? Yeah, it's the world record. <laughs> Holy crap. That's all. Yeah. Okay, so I'm not super into fitness, right? But I work right. out. I played sports in high school. I can't do more than 225. Yeah, and I feel I mean, pretty it's, strong in a gym doing 225. Like, it's holy crap. Good. It's actually the world record for my weight class. And then like the several above it, it's still the world record for the bigger weight classes. So it's it's pretty good. <laughs> okay. I don't know how to ask this question, but I have seen some powerlifting stuff where like, but is it a bench press like you would see in the gym? Somebody's like, takes it off all the way down, all the way back up. Or is there kind of a trick to it? We have to hold it on our chest for a one count. So you have to take it down, wait for them to tell you press, and then lock it out. So it's like a paused press. Man, I feel like I'm revealing some of my ignorance here in this, but I can't believe you can do that much. Like, I wouldn't have not have thought somebody that size could physically be able to do that. I get that a lot. And then I get it a lot that they assume I'm using performance-enhancing drugs, but I'm in a drug-tested, um, a drug-tested organization. I've been drug tested. Um, actually, I was just drug tested on Saturday. They showed up and said, okay, pee in this cup. <laughs> but have, okay, but are you, you're not doing them currently or you've never done them? I've never done them in my entire life. I think I have, my husband likes to keep track of this stuff because he thinks it's cool. But I think I've had over 60 drug tests in my career. Why? 
I, I don't know if this is like, but why not? Right? Like, how come you've never just like, man, I wonder what I could do if I did this? Oh, well, I don't need it. <laughs> well, I don't need it. But um, also, I still like to maintain my femininity. And it's pretty hard to do that when you're taking uh, performance enhancing drugs. I think they're just not healthy for you. They're bad for you. So <laughs> um, I'm very much into my health and eating well. And um, I just that I know people do it. And that's fine. That's their choice. There's powerlifting organizations that don't drug test, you know, so you can, if you're interested in using performance enhancing drugs, you can, you know, go do it. Um, but not where I lift. I would just be so tempted to find out like what I would, what, like, what if I did this, man? Yeah, but you're not a girl. <laughs> what if I said, what if I do this, but it would make me start growing boobs. Would you do it? Yeah, I probably wouldn't do it then, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit different. <laughs> yeah, it make you start having a high voice and then um, boobs and then maybe your penis would shrink up. Would you do performance enhancing drugs <laughs> to see how how much you could lift? <laughs> I mean, maybe if I could do a lot, right? Like, <laughs> like if I went from like doing 250 to 500, Listen, I'd be like, okay. It says a lot about you. <laughs> I know it does. Well, I would do it because I would be curious of like what I was capable of. I guess I think I feel like it's different because like powerlifting, no one's really making a lot of money at it, right? It's not like the NFL. If you take performance enhancing drugs and you perform well, you're making like huge bank, you know, or something like this. You know, for our meets, like we have prize money at our events and stuff. So you might win a few grand if you're good, but it's not like um, you could live off it. So for me, that wouldn't make sense. And yeah. it's not everything I am. I'm also a teacher. I really, um, it's important for me to set a good example for my students and my own children. And I just don't think that's healthy to do that. It's not for you. But would you, are you an anomaly in that? Or do most people tend to kind of side with your side and it's just the media blows it out of proportion? I honestly think it's probably split. Like for, I lift in USA Powerlifting. We drug test a whole lot of the athletes to try to keep it as clean as possible, right? Um, so I generally think most of the people that lift in my organization are clean. Now, of course, that's not 100%. You know, that's silly. Um, but I do think that um, I think people can be amazingly strong and the average person just doesn't get it. <laughs> Well, that's the thing that I have kind of at least learned from this podcast is that there's levels to things. You can be really good at something and then somebody who is exceptional, it's just a whole nother world. Right. Well, I, I, I have been told that I'm probably the best bench presser in the world ever, <laughs> men or female. Um, so, I mean, you're comparing yourself to someone that's just exceptionally good. <laughs> Now, why are you so good at that? Uh, well, it, I wasn't, always, I mean, it's been, I didn't just all of a sudden be able to lift this weight. I've been doing it for 25 years, you know, and I've just been putting on strength for a very long time. You know, I started off with, I think um, I worked my way up to 215. I think 215 might have been my first competition bench. Um, and then I've just gradually gotten stronger. I think some of it is, um, really good programming. We've kind of over the time learned how to do it really well with the right exercises. And I've been very good at nailing down the technique so that I feel like it really couldn't get much better than it is now. Um, I think I, I like it. So you work harder at the things you like. I think, especially as a woman, like we're not, we don't have strong upper bodies. And so when I first started weight training, it was the thing I put the most gains on, you know, was my upper body. Because, you know, we don't use a lot of chest and biceps in our everyday life, you know, as women. So I think um, I think those factors all had a lot to do with it. Yeah, when you said that number, I would have honestly thought that that wasn't physically possible for a, a woman regardless of size. But it, I mean, it is like the best. But if you look at like the women in my weight class, I mean, they're doing 275. So it's not um, super like out. I mean, it's a lot, but like the women today now that I think to like they're uh, for powerlifting women with a women division is growing gigantic. Like for part, first of all, powerlifting itself as a sport is growing in leaps and bounds since COVID. Um, and then the women's side, 
I would say like when I first started powerlifting and like in the late nineties, um, I would probably would have guessed maybe 25 to 25%, maybe 20, 25% of it was women. Like uh, we couldn't even fill out like a whole, like what we call a flight is like who you lift with. Like there's 14 people on a flight and you, you compete with those 14 people. Um, and we couldn't even do a whole weight class of 14, you know, at the national level where now is um, we have a hundred in each weight class and we're almost to where we're 50, 50 men to women in powerlifting. Have women, has that been, is it harder to get women to sign up than men? Not anymore. <laughs> I think social media has had a huge positive impact because you know, like I said, when I started, a lot of women don't go into the weight room because they're worried that they're going to look like, you know, the bodybuilders they see or they're going to lose their femininity or they're just going to grow gargantuan, you know. Um, and I think now with social media, there's so many of us like posting what we're doing and our bodies and um, people are saying, you know, oh, well, I can still do this and still look feminine and still look like a woman. Like, this is not going to make me start growing hair in weird places and, you know, stuff like that. So I think social media has brought it. And now we have girls in high school powerlifting now, you know, and then um, we have our, I help coach uh, for Midland University. Um, so we have the collegiate nationals every year. And, um, you know, there's a thousand women competing at the collegiate nationals, you know, so um, you're seeing it more as a sport and you're seeing women get into it earlier in life. So that's just ramping up our, our number. Do, do you think it can get to the point where people can make a living solely off of doing that? Um, I'm not sure. Um, like there's people that do like online coaching and stuff like that or open their own gyms, whatever. So they're able to sort of maintain their um like a an income with that um i think unless our sport gets mainstream and we pick up like some major sponsors probably not it's hard to say i mean it's growing so huge right now like our number our membership numbers are like off the charts i'm the state chair for powerlifting in north carolina here for usa powerlifting and we can't have enough competitions like they fill up within two days and then we have to start a wait list and it's crazy and we're do putting on one every other month you know it's just like we can't almost keep up with the demand it's been met is that is that any part of that like a shift in how people working are working out because i feel like before you know when i always think of women working out like it's just all right go to the elliptical machine well i think there's like just uh, so much more available now now we have youtube you know so we have um resources for people to go to to find out how to do things uh, people follow, you know, their favorite lifters. Um, so that's good. Now we have online, you know, coaching. So if you don't have a coach near you, you can have an online coach to kind of help you get started. Uh, but the one thing about powerlifting is we have like an amazing community. Like the people are supportive and welcoming and fun to be around. And so once someone is brave enough to, you know, enter a powerlifting meet, they all of a sudden have like this tribe or this community of people that's super supportive and they're all kind of into it for the love of this commonality. And it's the one thing that's kept me in the sport for so long. We've made so many wonderful friends um, over all the years that we still hang out with. We talk about our training. We, you know, throw ideas back and forth. Um, and especially the women, there's been a huge increase in women starting in their 40s which has been so cool like that i don't know if i and i sort of relate to that because i'm going to be 50 in a couple of weeks here so i think that generation when they were probably in their 20s like i was it wasn't as you know popular but now they see all these women in the sport and are starting to think well maybe i can do that and even physicians are starting to recommend you know um, some sort of weight training for bone density and health so they, they, we're seeing a huge influx of like what we call our master's lifters. Master's is 40 and up age group. And so now we have all these women that are entering in their 40s and finding these other women. And then they're just creating these really great relationships and support systems. Um, and it's just thinking fun. <laughs> so when you go into a competition, right? Like, so you have three chances at each lift. Is there a mm -hmm. strategy to that? Or are you just like, I think this is the most I can do? I'm going to do that. No, there's a strategy. 
Um, usually like you have the, your first one you call your opener and it's kind of a rule of thumb that you would pick a weight that you could do for three reps because it's like the entry in, like you don't want to ever like start so high you don't get a lift in, right? And there's rules of performance, like for the squat, you have to squat with your, um, the crease of your hips has to hit below your knees. So it has to be a fairly deep squat. And there's a couple other little rules. So you have three referees that are judging your lift to determine if it's good or not. So you want to start with a weight that you can easily handle so that you're looking good to the referees and you're getting like a number on the scoreboard. And then usually your second lift is somewhere near your one rep max, but one that you feel fairly confident that you hit. And then your third one, you go for broke. <laughs> you just kind of go for it, right? That makes sense. Yeah. Why wouldn't you kind of open up with the sec? do like the second one that's like, okay, it's pretty close. Like, Some why wouldn't you do, leave but... yourself with two lifts to really, two attempts to well, really push that's it? that's a little risky. We kind of think about the first one as being like your last warm up. Um, cause there's a lot, when you're competing, there's a lot of pressure, right? So if you just get that first one, easy one in there, like the fr pressure feels off, um, off of you a little bit. And it's, I mean, there's a lot of mental aspects to this, right? And so you've got, you've got to go out and stand in front of a bunch of people and lift this weight and get judged. And so there's, you know, there's the mental aspect of this competing as well. So, I mean, you could definitely like go for broke on your first one, but you know, if you miss, you're out, like you're done. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the way I do it. And most people do it, but I mean, everyone's got their own, you know, some people have certain percentages they do if they want their third one to be this one, they're, they'll percentage wise open with this one. But I mean, you only have so many heavy lifts in yourself as well. So my theory is why would I waste energy and strength on the first one? I'd like to save it for my second and my third one. <laughs> I don't know if this question will make any sense. This could just be a me thing. But anytime I've ever tried to like, all right, I'm going to try to really do this thing. I've never been able to feel like I fully turned my body on. Like to recruit everything. Mm -hmm. Is that a thing that you have to learn to do? Or is this like, hey, man, I don't know what you're talking about. No, you have to practice. You have to practice hitting what we call one RMs or one, run, one rep maxes. So throughout our training, we're practicing your body, you know, you have your central nervous system and that has to be able to react to that kind of weight load. And so if you're just going through your workouts, doing sets of reps of five or eight or whatever, and then all of a sudden you just try to go for your maximum, your body's probably not prepared really to hit that type of weight. And then we also have certain exercises that we do to help us with that. Like for me, I do what we call heavy holds. So like for the bench press and for the um, the squat, like I'll put an obnoxious amount of weight on it and I'll just hold it for a static hold for 15 seconds, just so I get used to holding like that crazy heavy weight. And so then it doesn't feel so like shocking when I'm going for a one rep max. And then we do what we call overloads. We, add, we put like a lot of weight on with some bands to help us lift the weight like off the bottom, but then you're pressing the rest yourself. So you do lots of various exercises to kind of prepare your body to be ready to handle uh, a one rep max. What leading up to a competition, right? Like what does your typical training look like? Oh, it's complicated. <laughs> What's the... What? Everyone kind of has a different way they like to do it too. I mean, I have a certain way. Um, I have a um, a programming app that you can get where I have like um, 10 of the programs that I like to use on there that you can, you know, subscribe and use. But we go through different phases. I'll go through like a high, what we call a hypertrophy phase, which you're doing lighter rate, but tons of reps to increase your overall bank base strength. But then when I get to a competition, I go to what I call my competition phase where one week I'm working on the speed of how I perform the lift and the next week I'm working on how much weight I'm work I can lift and I flop them back and forth. Right. Now are you just doing those three lifts generally leading up to it or are you doing all kinds of stuff? I'm doing all kinds of variation and accessories. <laughs> how the, then like okay a typical workout like how long will that take you then? Are you in there for like um hour and a half, 2 hours? I remember this old powerlifting joke that's like, no, man, I got to set like at nine o'clock, right? <laughs> like how will you, is there a lot of rest or are you just banging this thing out? No, you have to take, I mean, the idea is you're trying to lift, 
you know, a lot of weight. So you have to let your bus- muscles reactionate and get ready to go for the next one. The idea is not to get a cardio workout in. The idea is to build as much strength and muscle as possible. So we probably take mm, four to five minutes in between each set. So is there anything about your body, right? Like, is it, is it better to be taller, smaller, someone's uh, body like if you're composition? you're a power lifter, like I'm an, I'm not a, I'm not probably like, um, what would be typically like a best for power lifting. I have very long arms, um, which for the bench, a shorter arm is easier. Right. And I have really long femurs, which makes squatting, you know, way more distance up and down. So generally, um, if you're built for powerlifting, you're sort of a a shorter limbed person. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be good, but that's just kind of like, you know, with the squat and the bench or the deadlift, you know, you're just pulling the weight off the floor. So if you're shorter, you know, there's less distance to pull. Um, And same thing with the squat. So like, uh, yeah, I mean, kind of shorter, compact um, people are better, but that certainly doesn't make up everybody in our sport. Yeah, it sounds like you're just kind of strong as shit, honestly. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> were you, but was anybody in your family like that? No. It's just you, huh? It's just me. <laughs> How strange, My right? sister like has like allergic reaction to exercise, so she doesn't do it. And my mom, you know, when at her time, like they didn't even let girls do P.E., you know, when she was in school. So, I mean, maybe she would have been strong. I don't think she ever really tried. And uh, my dad was like a good distance runner and a basketball player, but he never um, really, I mean, he does weights now, actually. He's 80, um, 81 years old, and he goes to the gym every morning. And he can still bench press a decent amount. Okay, how much is your dad bench pressing? I feel like I need to know. It's like, um, like 185. But at 81 years old. 81 years old, Yeah. (laughs) So I feel like your strength probably comes from your dad. It might have, yeah. Um, Are you ready for some harder slash listener submitted questions? Oh, let's do it. What is your favorite and least favorite exercise? My favorite actually is the deadlift. Even though I'm best at the bench, I just love the deadlift. It's kind of like you only have to do half the lift because you're just pulling it up from the floor and then you can just drop it. So it's like you're only doing half. Um, So I like that. Uh, my least favorite is the squat or, and I, the other one I would say is Bulgarian split squats. Those are horrible. That's the worst thing in the world. Yeah. They're so good for you, but oh, are they awful? It's just like, it's just like, you have to like, I do those and I have to like mentally prepare myself. Yeah. Like, okay. Mm-hmm. Like the whole day. Yeah. God, okay. Those be... are coming up. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> They're going to burn. <laughs> exercise you wish was a powerlifting exercise like oh if they put in the whatever oh i would love to do that one yeah i would love for them to put um strict curling in that's a this is a bicep curl right but you're like yeah. up against a wall yes how much can you do um i think my best is 110 that's so much like wow that's a lot holy crap are you strong yeah. But do you think that, like, did you get into this at an age where you felt like, you know what, I, I hit my peak. This is the most that I could ever do. Or did you get into it, like, maybe after your physical prime? Well, I think, um, like, I, I, I'm, I was surprising myself the whole time <laughs> with what I was able, and it kept just going up. So I just, I didn't put a ceiling on it. I just kept trying to do, it was like an addiction. I just tried to get, you know, higher and higher. And, um, you know, like now that I'm a little bit older, the gains aren't as big, you know, like I'm happy if I can put a few pounds on every year, you know, <laughs> as long as it's still gaining, I'm happy. Um, but like, I guess, no, not really. Um, no, cause I was already like, wait, like even in the beginning, I was surpassing like my, what was even possible for me. I was like, holy cow, I'm doing more. Oh my God, I'm doing more. I can't believe I'm doing this way, <laughs> you know? So then I just, I, I stopped like questioning it. I just kept going. <laughs> but then how will you react to when it starts to come down? I don't know. I'm sad about that. <laughs> but I feel like I'm just going to be like, 
the representative of the geriatric population, and I'm going to keep busting down barriers as long as I can. I do love that every once in a while you see that video of like the 100 year olds running the 100 meter dash. Uh-huh. And they're still running. It's like 20 seconds, but like they're still doing it. They're still they're the fastest still person in the world. We had our Southeast Regional Championships USA Powerlifting last uh, Saturday. And we have this lady, her name's Ruth, and she broke the American record in the deadlift. I think she did over 200 pounds. And she'd only been lifting for a few years. <laughs> and I'm like, and everyone was going crazy. I mean, it was just so cool to see someone at that age pulling that kind of weight. How old was she? 70. Oh my gosh. Yeah. How are you? Okay, this is one of our questions. It just says, how are your knees? Great. I haven't had really, the only, the only problems I've ever had is a hip problem um, with my right hip. That's the only injury I've really suffered from powerlifting. Um, I think it's because I sumo deadlift, which makes your feet kind of wide. And so I had to do have a laparoscopic, I, I uh, shredded my labrum tendon in your hip. And so I had to go in and have them surgically fix it. And it's always just, a, it's never like, it's always a little wonky. Some days are great and some days aren't. But that's really the only injury I've ever had um, in powerlifting. Because I think this is kind of one of the difference between men and women also. I think like as women, like um, we listen to our bodies a little bit more. We're more concerned about doing it correctly than like loading on way more weight than can we possibly do. <laughs> Not to give men a bad name, but they're kind of more like that. And so that's why I love with work, working with women when I do seminars and things like that. I love the women because they're not like worried about showing me how much they can lift. They just want to know how to do it right. You know, so they're not going to help hurt themselves and they're going to execute the lift correctly. And so I think just being that way my whole life and just listening when things start feeling a little off, I can always back off. And um, that's kept me like healthy. <laughs> I've always heard that women are actually proportionately stronger than men. Huh, that might be true. But that men are just stronger because, like, we're we're just bigger, I guess. You have more muscle mass, you know, that's for sure. Um, and, uh, yeah, so even with, like, the bench press, everyone always asks me, like, how, much, how do I deal with shoulder problems? I've never had shoulder problems. <laughs> like, I, I've just always, you know, got into, like, a great position. I don't use my shoulders a whole lot. I roll them back and s- squeeze my um shoulder blades together to kind of use them a little less. And, um, and I just, I have, I've been just, I think smart about it. This one just says, what's with the suits? The suits. Oh, there is another aspect of powerlifting. It's called equipped powerlifting. I do what's called classic or raw powerlifting, which is what you would normally see in a gym, you know, t-shirt, shorts, whatever. Um, they do have equipped powerlifting, which is where they have like bench shirts, deadlift suit, squat suits. And you put these, super thick material items on they help you lift more basically is what it is what's the point of that i guess right like why it kind of sounds like not cheating right yeah but just finding yeah what's the point of it well i i don't know like when i very first started powerlifting that's all there was there was no raw or classic powerlifting it was all equipped so you had to wear a squat suit a dentist suit and a bench shirt um i the theory is that back in the 70s when powerlifting was getting going they started realizing if they wore tighter t-shirts you know they could get a better bench and then they started wearing thicker material and then it was just sort of this um i don't know this like oh if we keep adding more equipment we can lift more weight and win and it just went to astronomical proportions so i think in 2008 um is when uh usa powerlifting started offering raw or classic lifting and once that happened equip lifting went to almost non-existent and then our numbers started going crazy with the the raw power lifting because it it was hard um i never really got a lot out of the equipment because basically what it's doing is it's compressing you to make kind of like a spring when you lift and the more kind of um if you're not real squishy like you don't have a lot of extra weight you don't get a lot out of the the equipment because it can't compress you so I've always been very thin and like kind of long stringy muscles so like my I think my best bench um with the equip the bench shirt on was like 330 
Um, and I think my best squat was 405 and I actually surpassed my deadlift in the deadlift suit. I think my best deadlift was like 395 or something. And this was, you know, a long time ago, but, um, I never liked it. It hurts. Like it cuts you up when you use it. It's horrible. Yeah. It kind of seems like not cheating, but like, yeah, but that's not real. Yeah. It's hard to say like, um, I won the world bench press championships with a 320 pound bench press, but I really didn't do it. I always really had a hard time with that. But at that point in powerlifting, if you didn't put on the shirt, you were at a huge disadvantage because everybody else was wearing it. If this is you, say it's you. It kind of sounds like it might be you. But who's the Michael Jordan of powerlifting? <laughs> um, I don't know. That's pretty hard to say, honestly. Um, it's The female side is so competitive right now. I feel like it's changing every single year, um, especially on the international side. Um, like on my side, um, a lot of our we have we just we start a pro division, um, which now you can get a pro card and get invited to the pro events, which are basically where you can win money and things like that. And so at the Arnold last year, um, it's Arnold Classic is Arnold Schwarzenegger's big event he holds, which is a big deal. But um, so you do it by what we call dots, which is kind of basically a formula that tries to even out all the weight classes. So like pound for pound, who lis- lifted the most? And um, I took fourth um last year and the first place um girl um she was in the 57 kilo weight class i think but anyway so she won but then someone else just beat her like i mean there's nobody like (laughs) there's no one holding steady in that position probably the last five years it's been like even on the men's side too i mean there's so many people getting into it now that you think like this guy's you know, going to win. Um, there's a podcast called King of the Lifts and they kind of like commentate on all powerlifting. And they just did this podcast on like, whose era are we in now? And I had an era, um, you know, I won four world championships in a row for powerlifting and I won seven for the bench press. And so there was a time where I was for three years in a row, I was the best powerlifter in the world. So they gave me that era. Um, but now we don't know whose era it is because nobody's been able to maintain that spot more than one. Is there, a, on the men's side, is there somebody that's looked at as being like, oh, that's probably the best? Nope. It's just all over the place, right? Right now it's all over the place. There was like um, one of our um, super heavyweights was Ray Williams. Um, and he was like the best guy to beat for a few years. Um, but again, now it's like, and even we had Taylor Atwood. He was reigning for a while really good and Russell or he they had um, several like three or four years that they were the top dog but now it's anybody <laughs> what uh, what music do you listen to before a lift oh um, I always listen to ACDC Thunderstruck how come why how come that it gives me goosebumps when you, I don't listen to it in training I only listen to it in competition because I'm afraid if I listen to it too long it'll lose its effect as soon as that starts coming on, na, 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 my hair starts, ri- I mean, get now, my hair starts rising on my arms and I'm getting all like jacked up and like just, ah, so that's it. Do you ever have people slap you on the back? No, I don't like that. What's the deal with that? Why are people doing that? Uh, some people feel like it just gets them going. Some people slap in the face. Um, some people use uh, ammonia. You know what ammonia is? You know, like they, um, oh, smelling, you know, like if you were to pass out smelling salts, yeah, they'll sniff that, um, and get a real doop and then go. And I think, uh, all those sort of things are really kind of methods to, um, get your game face on and to get the nerves out of the way. So your nerves can really tear you down. Like you can get up there and you could be like, holy crap, I missed this in training. How I'm going to get this now? Like, what if this happens? What if I miss? What if I blah, blah, blah. So all those are methods to try to clear out the brain and get you focused and amped up. I feel like something like if I'm doing something and I think to myself, oh, that feels heavy, I'm done. Like however much weight it is, it doesn't matter if it's like 135. I'm like, oh, that's heavy. It's over for me. Well, again, it's like the training. We're picking up heavy stuff a lot, you know. 
And it's, and I do tell myself, like when I'm going for that third lift, I tell myself before I get them, it's going to be heavy. It's going to be heavy. Be ready for it to be heavy. Go down with it and see if it comes up. What's the worst that can happen? You know, you have spotters on every side to grab it from you. So, um, I, I especially with the squat, my squat is my weakest event and it's the one I feel um, the least confident about. So when I'm up there and I get under it and I walk it out, I just tell myself, go down and, and see if it comes up. <laughs> Will you have people though in competitions that maybe like they've got one or two great events and then terrible in the other ones does that happen well, that's the nice thing about powerlifting usually somebody has one thing that's like their best event and then you have to work hard at the other ones there's not a whole lot of people that are great at all of it why wouldn't you be great at all three though i mean i think like if you're strong you're strong yeah but certain certain things lend to different like if you have a huge ass and um hamstrings you're gonna be great at the squat you know, or if you have shorter arms and big upper body, you're going to be great at the bench. And for the deadlift, you know, the taller you are, the harder it is, right? So and a lot of people have great squats, have terrible deadlifts because it's kind of a little bit different. So it's all the muscles that you're going to use and where your strength is at. Is there trash talk? Oh, sure. Um, Like friendly trash talk. You usually don't see like a lot of like ugliness in powerlifting. Um, even the guys that are like going head to head, like, um, you know, you got the top threes guys back there, they're back there slapping each other on the back, you know, like, let's go. And maybe inside their head, they might be wishing they'd missed, but outside they're like being very supportive. Um, same thing with the women, like, um, you know, we're all competing against each other, but it's, uh, it really is not, there's no nastiness really back there where, and when you come off the platform, everyone's high-fiving everybody else, you know, um, because even though you're competing against other people, you're really kind of competing against yourself as well. You're trying to outdo yourself. So um, so it's really, it's not, I, in my experience, it has not been like nasty trash talking stuff, at least on where I lived. That That's actually kind of, that's actually one of our listener submitted questions is are you keep, are you competing more against yourself or the other people um i think probably both you know like you're always trying to we we use the uh, term pr personal record so you're always trying to pr your lifts you know outdo what you did last time minimally when you go in a competition you're at least hoping bare minimum you're going to pr in something um then there's records you know you want to break a record and it depends on the competition um, you know, and what you're going for, like at a nationals, you know, you're trying to win the national championship and there is a little competitiveness in the deadlift because, um, when you lift in powerlifting, like once you put in, I'm going to lift this weight, you can't change it. So if I say I'm going to bench, um, 275 on my first one, I got to do 275. If I miss it, I can either repeat it or I can go up. I can never go down. So there's um, a little bit of competition that way. And then with the deadlift on your very last deadlift, because this is how you determine who win, you know, you're adding up your total as you go. You can change your last deadlift twice. So like, let's say we're competing against each other and um, my total is 10 pounds above yours right now. So you're going to choose a deadlift 10 pounds over mine to try to beat me. But when you put that in, then I can put mine over yours. And then you can put yours over mine. <laughs> like, oh, so you're trying so there's to there's go... a little bit of strategy in the end, but you usually don't see that too much until you get to the national and um, world level. At the local level, you don't see that too much because the competition is just not that high. So have you ever like bluffed somebody been like? Yes. <laughs> how does that work? Explain like what's your like what's happening? Um. Well, like, so my husband's my coach and I'm his coach and my husband's like, he's really good. He's been our um, national coach. He coaches um, for the college. He's very good with piloting and numbers and understanding how things work. So like, um, it really, it's good to go in with like a huge, to have the biggest opener in the deadlift sometimes. And so he'll, he'll like put some obnoxious number like in for my deadlift, my opener, and you can change it five minutes out and then he might drop it back down just to see where everyone's putting their number in and then we'll drop in where we want to go. 
<laughs> mm, so there is kind of a gamesmanship. Now, is that only that's only for the deadlift though? The other that's one's not. only for. Well, and then we have bench only meets also, where you just do. We're only doing bench press, and you can do the same thing on the third lift of the bench press in a bench only meet. Um, future of the sport. It's bright. <laughs> I think it's really good. I um I think we've got um a good plan. I think um I think our society as a whole is wanting to be healthier. So I think a lot of people are going into some sort of, of exercise. We have so much science that says how much better weight training in particular is it for you and just your overall health and your bone structure and things like that. Um but I think um it's something anybody can do. Like, you don't have to have, like, a skill set, really, to do this. Like, you don't have to be great at dribbling a ball. Or you don't have to be great at shooting an arrow or whatever. You know, you don't have to have, like, a natural skill. Anybody literally can do this sport. You just have to get in and learn how to do it. And then a lot of it comes down to just how dedicated and how badly do you want it to see how far you go in this sport. Um, so I think we have that going for us that, you know, just literally – you could you could literally right now just become a member and go try a powerlifting meet and see how it goes, and then I guarantee you'll probably never leave. <laughs> That's pretty much all the questions we got. What's kind of coming up next for you? How can people get a hold of you? That kind of stuff. Oh, um, let's see. I have bench nationals coming up in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, August fifth. So that's my next competition. And then I have a um, the three lift, which is squat, bench, and deadlift. Is the next nationals is. Uh, I think it's September 15th in Memphis, Tennessee. So those are the next things that I'm currently training for right now. Um, I've got a couple of seminars coming up, one in Chicago and one in Atlanta in August, and then one in LA in October. So and I enjoy that aspect of it. I love um, working with people um, in real life and like just really helping them um, get stronger. Um, I just really enjoy it. I have a pretty good eye for for just helping people do little things that make things um, easier and better. So, and I just enjoy meeting new people. That's fun also. Um, for, uh, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm always putting, um, I try to make sure what I post is fairly useful. So I try to put on like, this is how I do this, or this really helps when you do that, or, you know, so I try to make it pretty useful, informative, and that's Jen Thompson 132. I also have a TikTok. Um, my uh, older son is 19 and we like to do like challenges and they're like, we'll um, see who can bench press the most or who can do the more most pull-ups or who's got the biggest biceps, stuff like that. Um, and some of that, uh, my, my TikTok, I enjoy doing that with him. And then um, I have a website, 132poundspower.com for just any kind of information. And I have my training app, which is thompsons.programs.app. If you want to do my train, my exact training, what I do is on there and it's an app that you can do and record all your training and keep track of your nutrition and all that really wonderful stuff. Oh, and I have a YouTube with tons of tutorials on there. It's 132 pounds of power. I just finished doing, I think, a 14 segment quick bench tips. Like I just broke it down from the very beginning. Like this is how you set your feet. This is how you set your hands. This is how you set your shoulders. Do you ever just go into a regular gym? Like what's the reaction if you go into like Planet Fitness? And Yeah, um, like we do like when we're on vacation, you know, or if we're just, uh, our gym is in our home. So generally we just train down in our um, garage gym. But um, when we go on vacation, we do. And usually it's a lot of staring. And then every once in a while, someone will just come up and talk to you like, hey, like I was just visiting my mother and me lifting in one of the things up there. And some guy walked up to me and he goes, you're obviously somebody. Who are you? <laughs> I mean, if I saw like if I went to the gym that I go to, which is like $19 a month, and I walked in there and saw a woman benching 315 pounds, I would be fucking shocked. Uh -huh. Like, holy crap. It's a little unnerving sometimes because you can see like in the mirror, everyone's staring at you. So <laughs> for me, like it just feels a little awkward, um, but kind of fun too. Cause usually at least a few people come up and talk to you. And I love talking about powerlifting. So <laughs> what would you say is your greatest feat of strength? You know, probably when my wife uh, broke her ankle and she was laying at the bottom of our stairs and I picked her up like she was out of a movie 
and I looked like it was a scene out of a movie, carried her up the stairs, put her in the car, and took her to the hospital. Okay, Dan, now wait a minute. When you say pick her up, are we talking all four limbs off the ground? Or was she kind of helping you a little bit and you were taking more credit than you should have? Oh, no, she she was dead weight, actually. She, she'll even tell you that uh, she uh, I've never been sexier than when I – quick 10-second intro. She wanted to, to buy a weight bench, and I had told her, do not buy the weight bench. We don't need it. So she, I, we had gotten to a big fight. This is before, before we had children. I went out to the bar and was having drinks, feeling pretty good. She decided to carry the weight bench down the stairs, missed the second stair, you know, and broke her ankle. So she's calling me while I'm out. And listen, everyone who's listening to this, I get it. I was a terrible, I think I was a boyfriend at the time, maybe a fiance. I don't remember. But either way, I know I was terrible. Regardless, uh, I didn't answer her phone calls at first uh, or her text messages because we were fighting. And then I finally answered one and she's like, you know, hysterical. How many phone calls slash text messages did you ignore while your wife was in agony on the basement floor and you were out drinking? I mean, pro- <laughs> I mean, pro- I mean, I don't know, probably less than 10 times of her calling. Less than. Yeah, it was a lot. I just, I just didn't want to. That's talk a to lot. Her. We were fighting, you know, we were having a couple's fight. Um, and we were married, by the way, because we were living in this house. So we were married, but we didn't have children. Or anything so you time. ignored the mother of your children <laughs> agonizing on the floor to drink at a bar with your buddies? Sure. If that, if that's, the, <laughs> if that's the simple sentence you're going <laughs> to go with. And yes, that is accurate. Okay. What's the time frame? What's the time frame between when the first call came in and when you finally decided, oh, maybe I should see if my wife is in trouble? I mean, probably 20 minutes. I mean, it's not like I wait, made, you know, it's not like I had her wait for kind hours, of, but I mean, it's kind of know. a long time. What if she was trapped under the weight branch? <laughs> well, she could have, she might, she could have expired. Would have been her own fault then. Could have expired. What are you, a, a, a public information officer? Could have expired. She could have, uh, she could have passed her mortal coil. No, she was, I mean, she was hurting. She had never, uh, never broken a bone before. So, uh, oh, yeah. she broke a bone? No, uh, she, so I mean, sprained it. They she she had a severe like the worst sprain you can have. But I swear, looked like she broke it. So wait a minute, did you being able to pick her up completely erase the fact that you ignored her phone calls for twenty minutes? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so I don't says. know if that should. I don't. I don't think that. I don't think that. I think she's probably lying to you. I think in the back of her mind, she's like, well, maybe if you would have answered the phone. <laughs> And your I mean, wife, obviously, the person I'm... you love most in this world is calling, and you just looked at the number and said, decline? Obviously, I'm a terrible person. I understand that. I would not do that now. Uh, but, you know, I also didn't understand the gravity of the situation. You know, your mind changes as you get older. Okay, yeah, you fell, I would say it's true. Yeah, you fell down the stairs. Is a bone sticking out? No. Okay, then get up the stairs. But Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty bad. It, it's only when you get older do you realize, like, oh, somebody might be in trouble. <laughs> she probably wow so you yeah. feel good about that though so what we've basically learned is that you ignore your wife while she's <laughs> agonizing in pain at the bottom of the basement and then claim that that's your greatest moment is carrying her back up the stairs after you kind of caused her to fall down the stairs in the first place see i didn't and that's that's actually been the point of contention ever since that story well why didn't you carry the weight bench down you should have been the one carrying the weight bench down I, I agree I should have been, but I was I was doing it out of protest or not doing it out of protest. It was, I didn't want the stupid thing in the basement in the first place. Where did you want it? I didn't want it at all. It was one of those like, hey, my coworker is giving this or selling oh, this. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. No, I don't weird. want another thing to put in the friggin' basement. And hmm. uh, Have you used the weight bench since besides anything – and for any form of how many times for exercise purposes has the weight bench been used? Probably less than a dozen times. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, that's that tracks. Yeah. Well, it, it's heavy. I mean, if you've ever carried like a you know a weight bench, I mean, it probably oh, weighs yeah, 30, heavy. 40 pounds. Yeah, that was really irresponsible to use a husband I, to allow to <laughs> you know not do that in the first place. No, I'm not taking any blame for that. She shouldn't have carried it or not even brought it home. Oh, it's her fault because you wouldn't do a job and she has. She sounds like a go-getter. She and sounds you know like somebody who's going to get stuff done. I should be nice to her because the day we record this, it's her birthday today. So, you know, I should not be speaking ill of her. No, you shouldn't, but you already did. It's already I done. Did, so it doesn't matter. But yeah, Okay. 
probably it. Do, do you have one of note? Um, I don't know if it's a feat of direct strength or a feat of strength endurance, but I once moved a – well, I, I once moved our entire house, and this is with me, my wife, and two kids, out of one house, into storage, out of storage, into the moving truck, into a new house, all of that in one weekend. And it's the only time – that I've ever felt like my tendons were sore from just simply <laughs> holding, like simply holding on to something. My tendons were sore, were sore. And there was an upstairs in a basement. And I had to That's... do that all by myself while my white wife watched our three month old. I felt, I felt like a fucking man. I'll tell you that. I felt like, like, man, I did something today. It, it is different as you get older. Like the things that, you know, that you take, pride in that you think are th feats of strength when all these young kids that are listening to us are like these aren't things of strength you're just two what, old guys right and what i'm always made by amazed by is if we went back in time to like us fifty thousand years ago or a hundred thousand years ago like that they would beat the shit out of us <laughs> like their physical abilities were probably so far advanced above what ours are now it's, it's probably incredible I, I don't know if I agree with that because I feel like we're much bigger people uh, now than then. But, but we're not that much bigger. We're bigger weight-wise. I think we're only a couple of inches taller. But I was reading a book, the only book that I've read in the last 10 years. It said we used to walk like 20 miles a day. Yeah, I mean, that's endurance-wise, I'm sure. But pure strength-wise, I, I, don't, I don't. I think we've only gotten stronger. I think that's part of the problem with society is – we value the wrong kind of endurance and strength. Oh, this is going to turn into a whole thing, isn't it? This <laughs> no, is going to turn I'm into done. a whole thing. I'm okay. done. I'll stop. Right. I'm done. All right. Okay. All right. Let's just, just, just move on to some people who deserve me uh, giving them shout outs. Let's see here. Uh, Antoine Trudeau. It's a good one to start with. Uh, Robert Herrera. Angel Felix. Sean Chiampi. Afrin Casado, Joe Byram, Josh Myers, Juan Espinoza, Bernardo Malta Jr., and Colby Granberg. Appreciate it. Colby's a solid. Colby's a solid name. You got to be from the Midwest, though. So it's funny because the next segment uh, that I'm debuting on the podcast is us just sitting here making bodily noises. Okay, which one are you going to go with? No, you go first. Just start farting. Make fart noises. I really can't do that on command, okay. to be honest with you. Well, that's terrible. Anyone can do it, but no, that is not the segment. Um, uh, the segment, and we can blame Elon Musk for this, uh, because usually at this point in the podcast, I go over some things. We have a little fun, uh, which we're going to have, I think. But one of those things includes a poll on Twitter. Uh, well, if you've been following that debacle, Twitter is a, can I say a goddamn? It's a goddamn shit show. Well, you just did. Yeah. Either way, it's a shit show. It's ruined, and uh, I don't. I don't think it's ever going to come back uh, to ever what it was. Um, not that anyone cares about my opinion, and I, I'm not a tech uh, know how, but it seems like Twitter is gone forever. Without getting into any kind of politics or stuff like that, there does seem to be, even from a neutral observer, there does seem to be something that's kind of been lost about it. Like what it just you just lost interest in it a little bit, whether that's because of what it has been become, the controversies, however you want to define them around it. But it's just kind of lost interest like, ah, done with that. I just I, I think a lot of it's the negativity. And I know that's most social media, but I feel like you don't hear hear it as much coming from an Instagram or even a Facebook anymore. I feel like anything negative about Twitter is, is, is well deserved in I don't I, I don't think it's because of Elon taking it over. I think he just wanted to control something and he picked a fucking dying ship. I mean, I will say again, without getting into politics, I lean a little bit left of center. And I used to get like tweets recommended to me that were a little bit left of center. But recently all I've gotten was like stuff that like, "Whoa, that's not anywhere in lines with what I personally think." So I do think that there was a shift that a lot of people have kind of like, oh, I don't really like this very much anymore. Yeah, I will 
It's funny you say that, and I won't get into it, but I am going to say one sentence about it. And that is, I think because of the last presidential election cycle, I think nobody wants to go through any of that again, no matter what side of the aisle you're on. Uh, and I, I think people are starting to get that more and more. And I, you know, I just think people are done with it. They don't, they don't want to see that anymore. And, uh, yeah. Well, I think anytime, like, right. Like, I think that you can extrapolate this to all of society is that you can watch an argument for a little while. And then after like, oh, okay, <laughs> I don't want to see this anymore. I think that's just kind of the phase that we're at, right? Like I'm tired of all this. I don't have time for that anymore. So all right. in saying that, I came up with this fantastic idea. Okay. Bold so gonna, statement. A bold statement to declare that your idea that has never been done yet is already fantastic, but okay, that's fine. We're going to see. We're at least going to have a little fun with it, and if it's ruined, I'll come up with something for the next podcast. Or if anyone has an idea, send it our way, and, and I'll do my best to ruin it. Okay. okay. Uh, so this is called Profoundly Pointless Fact or Fiction. Oh, okay. All right. I get this two weeks. That we'll do this, not because it's not good, but because you'll lose interest. No, if if it if it's good and, and you don't give me one word answers, because this can be a, a thirty second thing or a ten minute thing. Okay, so we'll see All what right, happens. Right, so right, let's see what happens. I have four different four different topics. I guess I'm okay. going to say a sentence, and you will start with you telling me if they're true or false, and then we can go from there. All right? Okay. First one here: a hippo's jaw, when opened to the full extent. Is wide enough to fit a sports car inside of it. What kind of sports car are we talking about? Are we talking about a Chevy Carvette? Are we talking about a Mazda Miata? I just need some specifics here. I <laughs> there's a lot I, of kind of sports cars. Some are pretty big. Some are pretty small. I, I'm thinking a a mid sized convertible. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I would think that that is probably true. I've seen some pictures of hippos opening their jaws, and they look like they're pretty what? big. See, why can't you just answer? I like. I feel like I just gave you. I just want specifics. Answer. Well, uh, yeah. We talking about right? Like, it, it could be anything. It is correct. A, a, a full grown hippo, when opening their mouth to full to the full extent, can fit a Lamborghini. Man, think of how much food that thing could eat. Yeah, and how fast of swimmers they are too. Like that's scary. They're mean animals. I think they kill a lot of people. Yeah, well, you know, it happens. Okay. All right, second one here. Uh, can you see the Great Wall of China from space? No. That is correct. According to NASA, the Great Wall of China is frequently billed as the only man-made object visible from space. So but however, true. it cannot be seen from space. It was debunked by a Chinese astronaut. And uh, for some reason, textbooks have never been changed, and it is still often uh, claimed as being true, even still taught in schools as being true. But how do they know? How do they know it wasn't just one astronaut with really good eyesight? <laughs> I don't. I mean, if if you want to look up his his credentials, it's Yang L I W E I is the astronaut that apparently made this claim. So. That he said that you could, or he said that you could not? You cannot see it from space. Maybe he has bad eyesight. How do we know this? Do we know information on the eyesight of the different astronauts that have tried to see the Great Wall of China? These are specifics that need to be involved. How do you know? If you couldn't see it, how do you know you were looking in the right place? Like, what if the Chinese uh, space program, you don't have to be able to see anything? Could you go up into space and be like, that's Nebraska? Um, no. Well... Maybe if you're up there long, no, you wouldn't be able to. No, do. you no. couldn't do that. So maybe everybody else was just looking in the wrong place. I would say this is unsolved. I, <laughs> I guess. Well, I guess we'll add that one to the unsolved category, even though it's clearly been debunked by by astronaut. one guy. By one guy. So how many astronauts would it take for you to believe it? Three people looking at exactly where it should be. <laughs> then I could believe it. But otherwise, how do I know that these people don't have bad eyesight or that they're looking in the wrong place? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, you're, I guess you're asking um, very valid questions in a weird way. It just seems odd that that would be something that somebody just made up. I, I mean, I, I don't know. But I love that. This is totally playing into what I was hoping it would, by like, the way. What did they see I mean, that they thought it was the Great Wall of China? It's pointless. I, I don't mean, it probably could be mistaken for a mountain range. At that level, you know, no, I don't know because you're seeing it from about. a flat surface, you're not seeing the height, right? 
Haven't you ever looked at a map, man? Like mountains are big. Great Wall of China is not that width wise. <laughs> uh, all right, here's another one for you. Okay. Um, do you actually think that you swallow eight to twenty four spiders while you sleep during your lifetime? That is the average number of spiders people think you may swallow during your lifetime while you're sleeping. No, I don't think that that's true. How would you ever, ever find that out? You would have to monitor somebody sleeping in a random room somewhere (laughs) to see how many spiders they actually saw. So unless somebody sat there in somebody else's room monitoring how many spiders (laughs) crawled into their mouth, there's no way that they could have an average for this. There's no way to figure that out. I'm not going to lie to you. You are three for three right now. Uh, That is... Correct. Uh, according to um, uh, Scientific American, and I have no idea if that's a credible website or not. Or okay. sounds like it is. It has science in it. Uh, I well, I don't want to be too uh, too quick to jump the gun. Uh, but our research consultant is uh, out of town this week. Uh, but that they say that spiders don't intentionally crawl into your bed, uh, and they for sure would not crawl into your mouth uh, while you're sleeping because of the vibration that you give would give off while you're sleeping, whether that be snoring, heavy breathing, etc. Spiders are afraid of us naturally, so they wouldn't do anything from, from going into your mouth on purpose. Yeah, let alone dude. let alone being swallowed, which, you know, yeah, so you are correct. It has been debunked, and um, the quote here is, spiders regard us much like a big rock, and that is from Bill Cheer former president of the American Arachnological Society. Okay, see, now I believe him. Why what would you, they think of us as a big rock? Uh, I mean, I can, I can go on here. Does um, he have spider telepathy? What the fuck does he know? <laughs> with, Bill, if anyone probably, knows Bill, please. Bill Shear probably knows. I mean, he's probably, like, they can figure these kind of things out, right? Like, if I was a spider, would you want... That's the thing. Like, most animals don't want anything to do with us. I think in the uni- in the animal kingdom, we are fairly big compared yeah. to other things in the world. Like, you know, it's... He, he goes on to add uh, in this, this quote, if a sleeping person has their mouth open, they're likely snoring, creating vibrations that would warn spiders of danger and spiders would go nowhere near that person's body, let alone their mouth. Would that be their spider sense would go off? Oh, boy. I do got to tell you, I watched Cocaine Bear over the weekend. And uh, you want to talk about animals. Um, I, I don't even know what I watched. I, I have no idea. All right. Yeah, uh, that movie kind of didn't do a lot. No, it's... It didn't really do a lot. It's uh, Yeah. The, the true story is, is probably more fascinating than the you know, story that they did on in Hollywood. Truth uh, is always right. stranger than fiction, man. All right, the last one. So you're three for three. I don't, can you be perfect on your, uh, I, I guess, the debut? Uh, but here it is. Uh, it's estimated, is this true or false, fact or fiction, uh, that it's estimated that the typical pencil has enough graphite to draw a line 35 miles long. True. Hot damn! Four for Did I get four. that one right? That seems Dude. like a ridiculous amount, right? Yeah, right? I'm... I, I, I cited that twice, actually, because I didn't believe it. 35 miles long from one number two pencil? Get the out of here. Is there any other pencil besides a number two? Have you ever had a number one or a number three pencil? Uh, No. Are there such things? Y- Wait. I feel like I might have had a number three at some point, but I don't really recall. I'm looking it up. Whatever. Do you have it something else or are you done? No, that that's the four. You went four for four. Like now oh. I gotta ch- gotta challenge myself. So pencil makers manufacture number one, two, two point five, three, and four. And sometimes other intermediate numbers. The higher the number, the harder the core and lighter the markings. So number okay. two is actually fairly l- low on the list. Or high on the list. Okay. All right. I mean right behind number one. Well, what what's better, a number two or a number one? Number one is usually always the better. It's easier and faster. Uh, okay. Is that your whole thing? Did that replace all of your questions? Yeah, I'm, that, that's, just, oh, okay. I'm just thinking about redoing it. You know, maybe I felt like that was good. We'll see next week. I'm gonna stump you though. That's my guarantee. Check us out next week because I will stump you. You will not how go do, four for four next week. How do you feel about me going four for four on the very first thing? Which one did you think was like that's gonna get him? 
Uh, well, I thought the spider one, cause that, that's a real misconception that, or the, uh, uh, well, that, or the, um, uh, the great wall of China. I thought both of those would get you. Cause those are misnomers, right? People, you know, think that that's true. They think that both those claims are absolutely true. So bravo, you win nothing, but hopefully people found a little bit of entertainment and some pointless knowledge in our last topic or uh, segment. Okay. So then are you ready for our top five? I am. Okay, so our top five is top five green flags. Red flag, usually like, oh, that's a sign that somebody's going to be a little bit, little bit something. But a green flag, sign that someone is actually like a good person. So top five green flags for people. So my number five is, uh, it's, it's probably could be number one, but we'll see where our lists take us. So my number five is having good hygiene. Um, by that, if, if I have to be more specific, you know, somebody, and this is just me, by the way, so don't, no one take offense to this, but this is what I look for. Uh, someone like who has, you know, clean fingernails, maybe look like they've showered in the last day, you know, somebody, just somebody that looks put together, uh, to a certain extent. I think you're kind of disparaging a lot of blue collar America. Some people work hard. No, uh, listen, that's not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying... But just for me, I mean, you know, if if I, I'm I'm coming at it from like um like going on a date point of view, not going mm. to work. Like if if I'm in a factory and I see a person, a man or a woman, whatever you're into, doesn't matter to me. If with dirt on their finger, okay, fine, that, it's normal. But like if we're out and about, or like if I'm at a dance club, which hasn't happened in ten years, and I miss it, but I see somebody with dirty fingernails, like I'm gonna start wondering, like why are they here with dirty fingernails? Okay. I can understand that. I would say that my red flag related to hygiene is if the person looks sticky. If they just kind of look like they might be sticky, that's usually a big red flag. I'm going to need you to elaborate on what that means. I can't even elaborate. They just have like a sticky look to them. Like, oh, you look like you might be sticky. Okay. All right. I hope you've never seen somebody like that? that. Into our like minute thing that you post on social. That's- I don't look if somebody looks sticky. Next time, look around at people and see somebody like, oh, they look like they might be kind of sticky. St- that's Can- that's to me is a red flag. My okay. uh, number five, my number five green flag is being on time. That's somebody who is punctual, usually a pretty good person because they respect their time and they respect your time. That that's a good one. Um... Yeah, I can't argue with that. Being on time is uh, is it's probably one of the most important things because, like you said, it shows respect. It's not just you know, it goes all the way around. I guess is what I'm saying. It's a very good thing to have all the way around. I agree. Okay, what's your number four? So my number four green flag, and this is a physical trait yet again, uh, but somebody that has a good, honest laugh or smile. Like you can usually tell right away if someone is a good person by how they laugh or smile yeah i would say somebody with a good laugh is usually going to be tolerable for sure yeah okay i can even tolerate somebody who laughs a little bit too much right like that may annoy you but it's not a sign of a big character problem like oh you're having too much fun is not usually an issue you can't laugh at everything like a fucking idiot but, yeah, you fucking idiot. You fucking moron. <laughs> um, my number four is return to the shopping cart. Okay, I mean, yeah, I mean, okay, fair enough. I mean, I probably would have, I probably would have put that at number five if I was going to include that on my list. But it probably should have been ahead or below. But then again, being my number time. three green flag is kind of similar to that. And I have somebody who opens doors for others. I don't consider that to be a green flag. I think that's just what you should do as a person living in society is opening doors. I don't know if I've ever had somebody that really directly did not hold a door. That they saw you and you were reason you were close enough, two to three steps, and did not hold a door. Really? I don't think that's ever happened. I can't think of a single instance in which somebody has not held a door within reason. Like you oh. were close enough and they also saw you. Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've had people, you know, two steps in front of me, let it shut, 
You know, I've had the, the worst is when, uh, you know, those revolving doors where you have yeah. to walk through. I've had people like just say, fuck you guy. And like pinch me in there. Like I had one time where I got stuck halfway in there. Like, thank you, whoever you were. Well, were you, how did you now? That's probably going to be your fault. What did they do that you got stuck in there? Did you I mean, try it, to like, did you have bad depth perception and think you could fit? Did well, you no, go too idea. early? Did you go too late? Did they speed up? Like, this like, kind of sounds like it's probably like, operator like error. Chinese astronaut. I just couldn't see well. Um, you just couldn't see what was going on? Uh, no, no, it was pretty simple. I My wife darted in, and I figured I'd have enough time, and the person on the other end either didn't see me or just didn't care and pushed uh, at a faster pace than I thought was going to happen, and... I got like my right arm trapped and, you know, I was able to get it out. Quickly, that but that fucking still, hurt. That could still hurt for a quick second. And I, you know, but by then my wife was calling me the idiot because I was supposed to wait, even though I was oh, trying yeah, to follow her and this person was long gone. So at the end of the day, you're right. I look like an idiot and I probably was the idiot. I mean, there's a revolving door. You can just wait. Like You can just wait for a second. It's not even that long. You I can mean, just like wait for like, and then you can like, get in the next side. It's like driving on the highway, right? You see an opening in a lane, you go for it. And that's what I did, but I crashed. <laughs> you crashed and burned. Car, yeah, man. that's your fault, man. Yeah, well. Uh, yeah. My number three is a firm handshake. A okay. good handshake. Now, it can't be, they can't be trying to overgrip you. They can't be trying to show like, oh, they can't do that. But a good, solid, in there, firm handshake. Do you remember... Uh, through all the handshakes you've given or have gotten, uh, like the ones that have been absolutely terrible. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 re- I categorize them into three different things. Actually, I categorize them into several different things. There's the limp one, but full grip. Like they got your whole hand. They've got the location and the placement correctly, but it's a limp one. Then you've got somebody that maybe is going to grab too much on the fingers or too much on the palm. Like they kind of miss it. Then you've got the people that'll hit you with a firm handshake, but they're not going to look you in the eyes. Okay. That's the one that that almost sticks with me the most. Is like, oh, but she didn't do that. And I've had a few people who'll try to like crush it, but I go rock climbing, so it's fairly you know you're not usually going to outgrip me because I have finger strength. Yeah, you do. Uh, my number two green flag is people who do not look you in the eyes during conversation. I don't know. Wait a minute. They don't look you in the eyes? Wouldn't that be a red flag? Or, I'm sorry, they do. Not don't. Do. I apologize. I think uh, most people do. Don't most people do that now? Uh, no, not really. My number two is along those lines, but it's different. And it's something that I've only noticed as a parent. My number two green flag is eye contact with children. If somebody is talking to a child and bends down to get eye to eye with them... That's somebody who you just take and put in some time and effort. Or it's creepy. Could be one of the two. I don't think that that's creepy. I think that that's like you're talking to the child. You're getting down there and having a conversation with them on their level as opposed to talking at them. Even you're treating a stranger? Them like, you're treating them like a person. So if a stranger kneels down to talk to one of your boys, you're going to be okay with that. Strangers don't do that. Strangers are creepy. Okay, all right. I mean, I'm just saying, man. Fair enough. Um, What's your number one? Somebody who listens. Is nobody listening to John? Nobody. You feel like people aren't listening to you, man? No, but I, I think, um, I think that's the most important quality that somebody can have, uh, physically or emotionally or mentally, whatever. Uh, is just being a good listener, and it's very easy to see that green flag, even if you don't know that person. Uh, because you can just tell if they're, you know, if they're being a good listener, that's that, that it's, I don't know, that's, it's fantastic. And it may be a weak number one, but it's, to me, it's, you know, you can't find enough good listeners. What? See, yeah, well, what I've been saying? doing this fucking podcast with you now for four and a half years, five years now, whatever it is. I think that you're going to agree with my number one and then realize that it is actually number one. Uh, my number one green flag is if animals like them. If a dog likes somebody, that's dogs are fantastic judges judges of character. 
If a dog see, likes somebody, they usually a pretty good sign. See, I don't disagree with you. That is kind of like a like a common knowledge thing, though, that I think might not be correct. Because, I mean, lots of terrible people have had dogs and animals. Throughout it doesn't mean that the life. dogs have liked them, though. Like if somebody, if your dog walks up to somebody else and seems to like that person, that's usually a good sign. I mean, my dog likes most of my good friends, and they're terrible people. So my dog must just have terrible sense of judgment. Maybe. Maybe it's the kind of dog that would leave its dog wife in agony on the basement floor for 20 minutes. Because you were oh, mad about having to carry a weight bench downstairs. Yeah, I'm pretty terrible. Um, I really only have two things on my honor to mention. Uh, one, which I'm thinking about it now. I probably should put it on my th- on my list uh, in the top five. But uh, somebody who tips well. Oh, yeah, that's usually, right. well. That's pretty important, though. That usually means, I mean, maybe not in today's world because. Tips well as a percentage know. of their in- individual income. I would agree with you there. Yeah, or even tips a respectable amount, even if you don't have, you know, even if you don't have a lot of means. Somebody who recognizes the other person for their service. Okay. Um, okay. And then okay. my second one is ba- somebody that can tell a good joke, like somebody that can kind of have humility, and uh, you know, just somebody who doesn't take themselves too seriously seems to be a good indicator of if they seem to be a good person or not. I kind of have that on my list. Someone who accepts blame. Like, usually if somebody says that was my fault, that's usually a pretty good indication of uh, a green flag. I also have putting weights back at the gym. <laughs> but yeah. putting, them ba- putting them back in the right place, right? Not putting the 10s where the 5 goes. Putting the 5s where the 5s go and the 10s where the 10s go. That's usually a pretty good, like, okay. It does get a little annoying, though, um, you know, when you don't and people give you stink eyes it is a little it is a little much like you want to pick up these 80s and put them back then you do it you know what i mean well why wouldn't people be giving you stank eyes if you're not doing it so you're getting mad See, because other people are looking people, at you because you're not doing the thing that you're supposed to do in a shared communal space so that this you're has, getting this mad at other people issue. because you're not doing your this job is planet fitness's fault <sighs> because they have that fault. stupid thing where if, Someone drops a weight, they play a siren. It's so terrible. So you just don't put it back? And it's ruined it forever for me. So you just don't put it back at all? I mean, well, no, I, I'm i a very courteous person. I have a lot of green flags, uh, actually. probably I probably have more green flags than anybody you know. Hmm. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I mean, you are a good person. I would have to give you that. Like, you are a good person. Thanks. You left your wife in the basement screaming in agony, but... (laughs) Yeah, well, you know... Just a little sensitive at times. I'm sensitive because you make me sensitive. (laughs) Pissed off. (laughs) I just see the spit come. God damn it! (laughs) (laughs) All right, like... (laughs) Oh, I want you to know that people in our YouTube audience have picked up on the wrong thing and now just like to do that to you. I'm very happy. I would like to thank everyone who does that, who comments on the things that John does and just goes wrong. Yeah, well, I you know, keep bringing it. I can take it, all right? I don't know. You complained about it for quite some time. You keep, you keep telling me I'm wrong, and I'll keep saying wrong things. Well, that's the way to do it. Nobody should learn a lesson here.